Hello and thank you to everyone joining us for today's webinar. I'm Lindsay Lamb and I'm on the marketing team at Pharos. I am very excited to have our CEO, Kevin Pickard, as today's presenter. Kevin will be sharing the Pharos perspective on the long-term impact the pandemic could have on office printing and print infrastructure. I got a preview of everything he's planning on sharing and you are in for a lovely treat. So before Kevin takes over, I'd like to call your attention to the questions area within your GoToWebinar panel on your screen. And while several of you submitted questions ahead of time during registration, if any questions come to mind while Kevin is speaking, please type them into the questions area and we will spend some time at the end tackling those. So Kevin, I'm going to turn my webcam off and the floor is yours. Excellent. Thank you, uh, thank you, Lindsay. And Lindsay knows uh, knows me well enough to know that I never give the same presentation twice. So whatever preview she got, she'll get something different. That's one thing I can promise. That's that's a safe prediction for me. Uh, so welcome everybody, and uh, and good afternoon. Uh, I was reflecting as we as I was going and preparing for this presentation. It was one year ago. Um, this week, as, as a matter of fact, I was giving our kickoff webinar for 2019. Um, and boy, am I glad it wasn't a predict the future kind of a challenge uh, back in 2019. Because certainly as I sit here today in our nearly empty uh, office that's uh, designed to, uh, to fit 100, um, I can assure you that uh, I was not predicting having my own collection of uh, designer face masks um, that in the last 10 months, I'd take one trip on, a, uh, on an airplane, uh, that all of a sudden that there'd be a cultural shift of shaking somebody's hand would be considered uh, taboo. Uh, none of these uh, would have been anywhere near my, my top 10. Uh, but this is where we are. Right? We've, uh, we're emerging, I believe, um, as we see the, um, the uh, vaccines being given certainly in the US and, and around the world. I think we are uh, on the other side of what has been a um, um, the most unique and challenging year probably for any of us uh, on this phone, any of us uh, listening in, um, that we have ever had. Um, uh, but even through this, even through the pandemic, even through all the change that we've had in this, uh, in this last year, um, some things don't change. And one of those, as I look at it, uh, is uh, the definition of health. Uh, at Pharos, as we look at the definition of health, whether we're talking about an individual, a society, a business, uh, a team, how, however we look at it, uh, our definition of health is, uh, is focused on resilience. Uh, resilience defined as our ability as individuals or as organizations to respond to the healthiest way possible to whatever uh, life sends our way. So no matter what we predict, uh, whether we're predicting life to change by a little or by a lot, uh, this is the primary focus that we have, our ability to respond to the healthiest in the healthiest way possible to whatever life sends our way um, in 2021. So, um, with that, uh, let's take a look at 2020 and the experience that we've had and the question that keeps coming up in, uh, in my mind and, and up again and again at Pharos and with some of our clients, and that is, um, so now what? Um, health is defined as our ability to respond. Healthy action is then fueled by our ability to predict, our ability to understand what is in front of us uh, we have to be able to predict as best we can, even in an uncertain world, so that we can take the most intelligent action that we can take. And that is really the focus of, uh, of this webinar, to talk a little bit about um, prediction, um, but also it's about the nature of change and how we think about that and how we've been responding to change. Um, and I have generally found that, um, that the best place to look for what the future uh, holds is to start with uh, to start with our past. Um, change is defined as the the change from uh, the movement from what was um, to what will be, uh, and oftentimes what will be is um, is 
directly or correlated and oftentimes uh, uh, tied to in, in almost like a magnetic way uh, to what was. Uh, and I think the, the nature of that is um, uh, as you look at homeostasis, what is it that gets us to um, return to patterns of the past? Uh, and whether we're talking about humans or systems of uh, business systems, economic markets, uh, organizational behavior, nearly any practice that we're involved in, um, absent some permanent impact, uh, homeostasis reigns. That is, systems will autocorrect. They will adjust and return to some form of a uh, stable equilibrium. If you talk to financial advisors as, as an example, um, they will often talk about um, being very careful about watching uh, short-term impacts on, uh, on financial markets. Um, that as long as your focus is on the long-term and you're, and you're not in some immediate need, uh, there are long-term trends that will have uh, short-term uh, shifts and shocks to the system return to those long-term trends. Um, they rely on this nature of, uh, of homeostasis that, uh, that systems will return. Uh, and so I think that's one of the questions that, that jumps out at me as we look at predicting where will we be, and in particular, where will we be as it relates to printing, where will it be as it relates uh, to work. Um, and the best prediction starting off is that uh, systems are going to fight change. Um, the best prediction of tomorrow is, uh, is yesterday. Uh, so fair enough as we're all sitting here to say, yeah, okay, um, but the experience that we're going through today is anything but normal. These are not small shocks that, that we are, uh, we've undertaken in 2020 that are continuing into 2021. Um, there really is no parallel in our lifetime for uh, what we have all been experiencing. Um, this pandemic that created the shock in how we work, in how we live, um, is a big one. And it is very likely to have longer term impacts. So how do we as business professionals think about it? And in particular, as, you, as we look at, uh, at this market of um, print and printing and its related uh, infrastructure, how do we think about it? Because surely we're not going back to uh, the world as it was um, simply pre-COVID with, with no change. Uh, and I would say that's a safe assumption. I don't think we are going to go back, at least not in any kind of reasonable uh, time frame, to our world pre-COVID. So the question becomes, what changes are we going to see? Uh, when do they happen? And how do they impact how we think about the market? And, uh, and I'll share with you my view and the Pharaoh's view uh, on that. Let me start with saying this is not just about prediction, this is also about the nature of change. Uh, going from what was to what will be. Uh, uh, and at Ferros, we study change. We're in the business of change. That's how we view our market. That's how we view our service to our clients. Our clients engage with us because they are seeking change. Um, and we are a change agent alongside them. Uh, so any predictions that we have of the future have to take into account human behavior. And I'll tell you that the first two steps of any change, uh, whether it's a change that we seek or as we have found with this pandemic, a change that's being thrust upon us, uh, there are two inevitable, undeniable stages that all individuals go through in change. Um, and those are number one, denial, and number two, fear. Uh, the first, Denial is our ability or, or our nature to hold on to status quo, uh, our desire for no change, to hold to what we know to our familiar. So this is our, our nature of denial. Um, the second stage is once we've gotten past that stage of denial or mostly past that stage of denial is then fear. The uncertainty and the fear and the anger that shows up when we start focusing on all of the unknowns of what comes next, um, what is going to lead us from this, this world that we knew to this world that, uh, that we don't yet know. Um, the time that we spend in these stages of denial and fear can either be short, 
kind of instantaneous when we're looking at uh, all of a sudden we we can't go to the restaurant that we were planning on going to for dinner on Friday night um, to much longer, which is um, uh, longer term changes related to market shifts, business shifts, losing uh, losing jobs, uh, um, and and so forth. We can go back and forth in these uh, in these denial and and fear stages. Um, we certainly went through this, and I went through it. Just to give you a quick sense of of um, uh, one quick example of this, just going back to uh, where were we when uh, when this all started back in March. And I remember going through my head saying, "Okay, we're go we are closing our office. We have a we have a pandemic that's making our way through. Um, we are concerned. We're sending people home to stop and create social distance." And I was fully prepared for uh, for us to be shutting down the office for a matter of weeks, and thinking about things like uh, how much how much watering do I have to do of my plant so that it will survive the couple of weeks until I until I get back, um, and moving from there pretty quickly to one month later or even six weeks later, uh, saying why the heck did we just sign a 10-year lease on this space which is largely now empty, um, especially when productivity and efficiency in business continues uh, with people at their houses and in, in a completely distributed fashion. Um, boy, we're never going back to the office. So the the nature of these kind of whipsaw events between the, the anger, the fear, the anticipation, um, uh, as we go back and forth, what it means is our ability to predict um, the future should be considered suspect. Uh, in the nature of these changes, especially in uh, in early change, and if you look at some of the early change, and I would say it's just to a large degree we're um, we're still there. Some of the early predictions, uh, it was a matter of of no more than a couple of months uh, into this uh, uh, pandemic that we heard customers and businesses and um, and the press and the consultants out there saying, "Boy, the future of the traditional office is dead." Uh, business is continuing as as per normal, as as uh, fully efficient. Um, so why are we spending all this money on uh, on office space? Maybe there's a new way for us to, to work. Um, so we should be embracing this uh, the nature of this uh, this change and shift. Um, the core component of that um, worker productivity might even have increased as a consequence of COVID. Some of these meetings that we have and, uh, and transportation back and forth and commuting and so forth, um, our elimination of these impacts of, of business might mean that we're being more productive um, than we were before. Uh, and another one that uh, that popped up pretty quickly and I saw just just again recently is as in the in the press, um, education and the future of education has changed forever. Um, there will be no going back in the world of education. Um, whether we're talking about individuals or groups or organizations, um, we can hear inside of this the the back and forth of denying the change and uh, and embracing change, the the fear and um, and a focus on uh, assumptions of the change, much of which is uh, is uh, emotionally uh, laden. So uh, that doesn't mean that it's wrong. I'm not suggesting that any of these are wrong. What I am suggesting is we need to be suspect. Uh, each of us who is looking at making decisions about uh, changes that impact our organizations, uh, our teams, um, the, the services that we provide, uh, we need to be suspect about those changes that we are, are looking at in this window of time. Um, and in particular, because of uh, one of my old, Favorite um, writers and old uh, people who have read it. It's I think this this book probably came out in the in the, the late 80s, maybe even the early 90s. And that is Peter Senge on the on the fifth discipline. But one of the one of the items that was that Peter Senge had had identified one of his uh, laws of the fifth discipline, uh, law number seven to be exact, was that cause and effect are not closely related in time and space, um, but we as humans, no matter whether we say that or try to interpret it, it's not how we think. We expect immediate cause and effect. Um, why do I why do I bring that up? Um, because as we look at the impact of the pandemic, 
and the immediate causes that we had inside of our, our organizations. Uh, my own uh, itself at, at Pharaohs, uh, all employees were sent home. Uh, we prepared uh, uh, for disaster recovery and, and, uh, and availability. And we were prepared for people to, to, to lose an office, to lose one of our offices or both of our offices. So our systems could continue. We went into disaster recovery mode. Uh, but somewhat surprisingly and pretty quickly, we realized that um, we have not seen a significant drop in productivity. Uh, we kept going back to, to our employees to say, what else do you need? How else can we serve? What, what's missing? What's breaking? What's breaking in the way we serve our clients? Um, and somewhat surprisingly, we, we kept seeing not much. Not, not, not much is changing. We are adapting. We're resilient. We're adapting to these changes pretty quickly. Um, so we're not seeing this, uh, this change in, uh, in productivity. So therefore, we, pretty, we get pretty quickly to, therefore, offices are overrated. Um, cause effect uh, without taking into account that cause and effect are awful, often not closely related in time and space. Um, as time went on and we look at what's happening in this, uh, this market today, a uh, recent survey of, um, of corporate executive sur uh, survey from uh, Enable was looking at, tell us now how you're viewing what's happening in this, uh, in this market that we're all operating in. Um, and the results were striking. Um, we're used to seeing uh, common, commonality or agreement in the 50%, 60% range. Um, but inside of this survey, 84% of those surveyed were concerned about managers' ability to manage remotely um, over time. 81% were concerned about declining morale. And I can tell you it's been a concern uh, here at Pharos and one that I've heard echoed with our partners and our customers. 76% concerned that we were getting a false read on productivity. Go back to law number seven from, uh, from Peter Senge, um, that over time is when we see the impacts, not immediately, but over time, we begin to see the impacts on, on uh, productivity. Um, 75% concerned about home and life distractions. Um, and I think that not just on the, uh, the impact on work, but the impact of our employees. 74% uh, concerned about lack of visibility uh, inside the organization between employees and between uh, supervisors and employees, as well as from employees to employees and groups to group. Uh, so pretty clear that corporate executives were beginning to recognize We've got growing concerns around uh, the, the longer term impacts of, uh, of what we're seeing in this COVID environment. Um, but it's not just the supervisors that are saying that. 51% um, of employees um, have expressed concern for work-life balance and the impact that, uh, that working from home and this this um, Uber mobility that we'll, we'll talk about has had on them as individuals. Um, and on their families. So, uh, so I think as time goes on, we begin to get a clearer picture of, of uh, where we are. Uh, and it's a good reason for us to hold loosely to our predictions of, of what's going to be in, as we move forward. Um, fundamentally, I think part of this is because uh, as we look at COVID-19, um, COVID-19 is not an evolution, evolutionary business change. Darwin is not at play here. Um, it's not like we all uh, got together and said, um, uh, we're going to send everybody uh, home and see if that's a, a better answer. It is a systemic shock um, that the pandemic has, has brought to us. Um, taking a step back, we worked the way we did, uh, with the interactions the way they were, uh, using the tools the way we did, in the offices the way we did uh, for a reason. Absent some compelling and more permanent force uh, that will create a long-term systemic change, uh, my belief is we will return to a reality that is gonna be much closer to 2019 than has currently been predicted by most of the articles that, um, uh, that I read. Um, true data points, uh, 
continue to uh, uh, support that. When we look at uh, in Asia, let's get very specific about this printing space. When we looked in Asia at markets and businesses that began to open up and we started sending employees back to the, uh, the office after a, an extended uh, uh, closure, what we saw was that pretty quickly, within a matter of a couple of weeks, their relationship with their tools, their relationship with print and printing went back to 90% plus of what it was pre-COVID. So uh, it's safe to assume that there are data points which would suggest that uh, habits will return. Um, this is not to say that there is no impact and we're not gonna see a long-term impact. Change absolutely does happen. And shocks in our system make change happen faster. Uh, one of my favorite quotes uh, uh, is from Bill Gates, um, looking at pred prediction. Uh, uh, and he, his, his observation was that we always overestimate the amount of change that's going to occur in the next two years. And we underestimate the amount of change that's going to occur in the next 10. Uh, and I love this quote because it, it seems to ring so true. Uh, our ability to predict. Uh, and over predict what's going to happen immediately in front of us seems to get proven time and time again, even when we try to keep this in mind. Um, true change takes time, but it absolutely happens. So my view is that this pandemic uh, that we are going through and the business impacts of the pandemic um, are having the effect of speeding this time. In many ways, they are taking this 10 years and saying this 10 years is going to be compressed. Uh, but I don't think it's changing the nature of our overestimating what we think the impact is going to be in the, uh, in the near term. So I want to address what are, what are these forces that may be impacting the, uh, the nature and the speed of change that, that I think we're seeing inside of the pandemic that are driving how uh, we at Ferros are looking at the market and how, and how we're looking to uh, serve. Um, and I, I want to take a look at the at the macro uh, the macro forces uh, inside of this. And I don't want to dis I want to distinguish this from the uh, from the micro forces um, that are going on. Um, importantly, because the micro forces are the ones that tend to hit home, and they hit home very personally. Uh, there's no doubt that um, that the amount of change and these micro impacts, uh, mi micro not in um, in uh, scope but in scale. Um, that impact each of us, whether we're talking about um, business closures, uh, family challenges, uh, job losses and, and layoffs, uh, health, uh, even life and death. These, these are very real impacts. They're personal. Uh, and most unfortunately, uh, many of them can be at least long term, if, uh, if not permanent. So uh, the focus here is not so much on those on those impacts as it is more on the systemic impacts at the uh, at the business level, at the global level. What can we predict as we're looking at how we serve um, our business clients and for those of us in this in this print space, how we serve our end users and how we uh, serve our businesses that that depend on this. So our focus is more narrowly on these macro forces. And so what what are they? Uh, number one is learning. Uh, when we see this kind of a shock, it forces us all to have different experiences. And those new experiences accelerate learning. Um, that accelerated learning means that, uh, that, that we are going to impact how we see the world, how we view the world, and therefore our actions on a, on a faster basis. Uh, we see new problems that emerge in the market. Uh, so new innovation is driven out of the sense of this, this new market, new problems, new challenges. Um, we create new habits, uh, certainly uh, just how we work, uh, how we interact uh, is, is uh, we'll talk about that in, in, in a little bit, but uh, uh, new habits are, are, are created out of uh, force. Um, wealth has shifted from business to business, sector to sector, group to group, country to country, uh, and those wealth impacts, whether we're talking about wealth as a, as a form of, uh, of uh, actual cash, you know, uh, or whether we're talking about it in terms of customer shifts, market shifts, decision shifts, 
um, that has long-term impacts on the on the business. And then over time, you're looking at value systems and and uh, and cultural change. These are the types of uh, macro forces that will impact how we think about and how we operate uh, going forward in the market. And I want to address a, a, a couple of these. So um, experience, and this is one that um, that we all went through and had early conversations, especially with some of our enterprise customers. Um, Uber mobility. Mobility was not created as a consequence of this uh, of this pandemic, um, but boy, was it accelerated. Right? The idea that people were working remotely, that um, that we all wanted to be able to um, access assets remotely, to be able to connect to our corporate networks um, remotely. Um, this was this long predated the um, the pandemic. Uh, the idea that in a matter of uh, of weeks. Um, organizations of tens of thousands of, of uh, users or, or employees or hundreds of thousands of employees were going to find themselves with every single employee remote um, created this massive learning um, of how do we learn to support this. Organizations were designed to support growth or, or expansion of mobility of 20 percent, 30 percent, but but growing mobility of a thousand percent as 10x the number of people are trying to connect to assets and operate remotely and uh, use VPN connections and uh, and and so forth. Uh, it's just a, a massive amount of learning and, uh, and learning that we had to tackle uh, quickly. Uh, it really accelerated this, this number too. Uh, we've been talking with leading firms and this was part of my discussion with uh, my presentation a year ago, was talking about the, the forecasts of the elimination of the corporate network and how some of the earliest uh, customers, earliest market leaders, the innovators, were beginning to create organizations without a without a corporate network, designing that there was not going to be firewalls. Um, the organization and all of their employees would be on the open uh, wild west of the uh, of the corporate network. Um, we went from having just innovators there to lagging organizations being forced to adopt that model um, immediately. So. Um, so that experience shifted the rate of adoption uh, in the market. Security and the security impact of both of those. Um, massive challenges for uh, organizations looking at what that means for, uh, for their clients and, and for their organizations. The distribution of corporate assets. Um, uh, organizations sending tens of thousands uh, or thousands of just narrowly from our perspective, thousands of printers being sent home for home use. We had gone through with these, these organizations of ripping out all of these private devices, personal devices from a security standpoint, from a cost standpoint, from a tracking and management. And all of a sudden we find ourselves flipping that on its ear and sending out thousands or tens of thousands of new uh, printer devices and, and other devices required at home to support people. So, this mass distribution of corporate uh, assets, the acceleration of IoT, because all of these are now being connected directly to the internet, um, no longer to some corporate network, um, all driving this necessity for infrastructure as a service and how we're supporting infrastructure as a service. So this real ripping the Band-Aid off of some of, these, uh, some of these changes that people had been planning out for, these are changes that we're planning for um, five years hence, 10 years hence, and all of a sudden the Band-Aid is, uh, is, is ripped off. So those are creating what, uh, th these are going to create these experiences, um, permanent or long-term change. Um, they also created acceleration of, uh, of innovation, one that we hit almost immediately, zero touch. Um, it was not even in our mind that we were going to have to start looking at how do we enable our customers to do what they need to do without allow, without forcing someone to even touch the uh, the user interface of a printer um, without even having to uh, log in how do we create a zero touch experience uh, and and do it quickly um, not just us but uh, but but many others um, zero trust zero trust to the the idea that um, that the um, the wall and moat model of um, of traditional security was going to go away once everybody is already outside and on the network. Um, zero trust became 
no longer something that we might migrate to. It became a reality and a reality quickly. Um, and you look at things like the solar winds uh, uh, cyber attack not that long ago. Um, that cyber attack, uh, another demonstration of the need to embrace new ways of thinking about security um, uh, and embracing zero trust inside of that, um, zero infrastructure. Uh, it's very hard to start looking at how do I use a corporate infrastructure when people are outside of that, uh, outside of that infrastructure, um, which then drives the need for cloud ready native, um, cloud native uh, technologies. Um, some of that being driven because people are remote, some of that being driven by the nature and change of the organization itself. Um, companies like Amazon hiring 400,000 people, um, that requires a new offices, new space, and we don't have the time to create the kinds of infrastructure investments we would in the past. So, um, so embracing zero infrastructure and infrastructure as a service, um, and then the elements inside of this, how do I track manage all of this, uh, all of this remote assets? Um, how do I know what's happening at, at these printer devices uh, uh, to, to speak very close to home of, of what's happening in our corporate, uh, with, the, with these corporate assets as we look at them remotely? So these technologies and embracing these technologies are driving what we see to be both short-term and long-term acceleration of shifts. Um, also new habits. The acceptance of video conferencing, uh, what we're doing here, um, the trust that is uh, showing up among remote workers in remote working, um, the acceptance of that is no, really no longer even a question of whether it's something that's accepted when it's the only way that uh, that we operate. Uh, micro meetings, micro events, popping up all uh, all over the place. Uh, just reading an article um, uh, last weekend about micro weddings um, and businesses that are being started to create micro weddings and they're being started because people believe these micro weddings and micro gatherings are going to take place um, even after we uh, we look at COVID changing the way we think about how we get together and how and and um, and operate and then the concept of the always on workday right um, habits that we're picking up as individuals, that if uh, there is no distinction between going to work and coming home. Um, and not all of these are welcome. Um, in fact, many of them are absolutely not welcome. Um, as humans, we tend to be stubborn and fickle. Um, we will return to old habits about as quickly as we bring on new ones, if, if not faster. Um, what what has over time become this nature of lack of connection and, and connectivity is creating this and fueling this desire for people to return to community. Um, job loss and turnover, uh, these are not considered improvements to um, organizations, nor are they considered improvements for, for individuals and the impact on individuals. Um, our reliance on how we learn, engage with each other, um, the teaching that we have inside of organizations and supporting each other from whether we're talking about IT or, or new employees onboarding people. Um, all of these, all of these are, are um, forces that are not easily replaced uh, and yet their needs, their habits that we have of how we work together. Um, my personal belief is that these old habits that we have of gathering in community, working in community, working in collaboration, um, engaging with each other. Uh, and I'll add print to that list. My belief is they will return and they'll return probably as easily as, uh, as they've been taken. Um, I was talking about uh, um, Amazon and this wealth shift. Amazon hired 427,000 employees in 10 months. That's just astronomical. Uh, that number of employees and that amount of shift and change um, that's been going on inside of, uh, of Amazon. When we look at our space, this, this printing space and what's happening in the printer market, uh, whole flip side of this, um, we, we have a market that, that has been hit hard by the closing of the offices. If you look at the printer OEMs, the forecast for full year 2020 is that operating profits will be down 61% um, versus 2019. Um, due to uh, due to COVID and, and office changes. So these are huge, huge, un unprecedented shifts. They create this uh, volatility and uncertainty. 
that's not going to go away um, quickly. Uh, that is the new norm. We're going to expect volatility and, um, and uncertainty even as we begin to emerge. Um, it's created this focus on deferring expenses where possible. And we've certainly seen that with uh, um, our customers and organizations that are deferring bringing in new devices um, because there's uncertainty, um, not just because their offices are closed, but because we don't know. It's hard to predict what's coming next. Um, but then also supporting rapid expansion um, where needed. And that also is, um, is driving people to make decisions that are, um, that are shorter term in nature. Uh, customers seeking a new level of flexibility. We're seeing organizations that used to go into purchase uh, asset, and purchase you know, fleets of devices who are now looking at uh, uh, managed print contracts where they're asking for um, 20, 25% flexibility in the number of printers and print assets that they're going to have under contract from one year to the next. Um, creates a whole different both opportunity and challenge for organizations who are looking at how do I support this? How do I support that level of, uh, of flexibility? Um, from our standpoint, we've seen a massive growth in people looking at software as a service. The as a service model um, is becoming the contracting norm just because we don't know. We don't know where this, uh, where this shift is going. Uh, so we're seeing these macro impacts and, uh, and, and what it's having on the, the impacts that it's having on the market. So let me talk a little bit about how, how Ferros is responding. What are we what are we doing and how are we seeing this uh, moving forward? And then then we'll kind of begin to wrap this up and and, and move to uh, some questions. Um, so number one is um, we are continuing to hear from our customers um, that printing remains a dial tone service. Um, so. Uh, some of you may have seen this slide from a from a, uh, a presentation I did a while back. I forget it. I, it's it's worth pulling back out. A, an old favorite of mine, um, 2001: A Space Odyssey. And when you look at what's happening uh, up up on the moon, Stanley Kubrick, as he was uh, developing this, one of the one of the greatest futurists of his time. Um, even when you look at Stanley Kubrick up on the up on the uh, the moon, um, our relationship with printing and with and with paper has been is is so tight. Um, that without even really thinking, uh, he's got printing happening on the moon. They're handing around color documents back and forth in a in a a, a, a moon rover. Um, it's a way of of working for us that has been around for so long that it is a habit and it is something that we are not going to uh, see go away uh, quickly. So printing remaining a dial tone service is something that we continue to um, to expect. Um, it's not so much the printing that we see that is going to be changing in this in this uh, near term, although we do see a tremendous amount of of uh, volatility in that space. Um, it's the uh, it's the way that printing is delivered. This is where we see the biggest shifts happening. Like the stock market, I, I my belief is that printing will will return to its um, it's old kind of trend, albeit maybe uh, maybe a little bit uh, accelerated. We've seen a long-term trend of one to two percent of uh, print, 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 printing decline year over year. Uh, I believe that the that the COVID pandemic is going to accelerate that. I don't believe it's going to accelerate it to twenty percent, thirty percent, even ten percent. I believe that what we're going to see is um, and what we're seeing for those organizations that have begun to return to the office and those um, those countries that have begun to see this is that volumes will return to 85 90 percent maybe even a little bit more than that of their pre-covid levels by year end 2022. Uh, we, we will see offices beginning to open as we get to the middle of this year um, we're still going to see right straight through the summer um, businesses with offices closed education uh, impacted we're not going to see a quick return but as we begin to get into the fall and offices begin to open and then as we start getting into 2022 is where i think we'll see the biggest impact of these uh, of these changes uh, what we will see is that how printing is delivered is going to change um, and that is going to be based on uh, based on these trends of, of security and uber mobility and flexibility and uncertainty um, that we're seeing inside of this uh, this market. 
So where's our focus at Pharos? Um, number one is um, we have an accelerated focus on printing infrastructure as a service. One year ago, that was the presentation that, uh, that I gave here um, as somewhat predictive of what we were seeing in the market. In 2020, we saw nearly a doubling of our customers who have embraced um, uh, infrastructure as a service and software as a service uh, in 2020. So through the COVID period, um, ex accelerated growth in this space and embracing it. It did not all come with new printers, new printer growth. It came as infrastructure changes that people had to put in place. Um, that was the prime driver of what we're, uh, what we're seeing in this space. Um, so we saw rapid growth in this in 2020. It currently dominates nearly all the conversations that we're having with, co with customers going forward. Uh, we expect to see that continue. Focus on zero. Whether we're talking about zero touch, uh, I think that is going to continue even as we begin to go back to uh, back to, to offices, even as we begin to emerge from the from the pandemic. I do believe that um, people using masks, um, people being careful about uh, about what we touch, where we touch, and how we interact with each other uh, will continue for quite some time. So I think zero touch will be a focus. Um, clearly, zero infrastructure, um, the Internet of Things native cloud technologies, um, partly based on mobility, but al also partly based on organizations that are just continuing to focus on what is what is their core. And the core for most organizations is not managing a print infrastructure. So they do not want to manage a print infrastructure. If they can find others who will uh, do that infrastructure as a service, they will. And clearly the continued shift to, um, to zero trust, uh, also driven by this um, this ongoing embracing of zero corporate network or the the world of the hybrid network where employees and corporate assets are outside of what we would consider the the traditional corporate network now, once that once uh, that that Pandora's box is opened I don't see people going back to um, the way we were managing IT assets uh, prior or trying to control them and control information inside the firewall. It's it's out and I don't see that changing quickly. The other element inside of this, and you'll hear about this in coming webinars from us, is the this nature goes along with printing infrastructure as a service, uh, and that's direct printing infrastructure as a service. Um, the idea that, that um, printing, printing as we know it, I hit file print, it comes out on a printer. Um, enabling that flow, enabling that process in a truly um, zero infrastructure, uh, secure, zero trust um, model for uh, organizations, whether you're in, an, in a corporate infrastructure or across corporate infrastructures. This idea of eliminating the printer infrastructure, but still allowing all printing devices that exist today and all users to, um, to enable printing is something we have heard a, a rapid increase in demand and it's something you'll be hearing about us shortly watch this space as we uh, as we introduce that um, accelerated going into 2021 uh, it was something that we had on our roadmap that we've pulled forward pretty pretty dramatically because of what we're hearing in the marketplace and inside of this is uh, mobility um, whether we're looking at um, at google print ios android um, concepts of, of no network all of this needs to be embraced because, as I mentioned before, we don't see that going back into the box. Um, so this is where we are focused, um, not so much on the nature of printing changes as the nature of the infrastructure, how we operate, how we communicate, its impact on security investment is where we see this, uh, this changing. Uh, but the other thing that I will say is, is uh, we're always listening. Um, we listen to our customers, we listen to our partners, we listen to markets be, beyond ours to understand um, and read. Because whatever we predict, um, we know it will not be exact. Um, so the definition of health does not change. It's our ability to be resilient, our ability to respond to whatever life sends our way. Um, what I can tell you is that all of our, all of our customers, all of our partners, um, continue to talk about and see printing as a dial tone service. Um, not strategic, but absolutely necessary. Um, COVID has absolutely impacted print volume. There's no question about that. There's no, um, and, and 
that impact is going to continue for some period of time. Even as we see it return in late 2021 and into 2022, um, that, that impact will continue to fluctuate and we'll see it in different markets. Um, but as offices open, as we ad adapt and become flexible and make our way back to uh, how we worked in the old world, I, I do expect that printing largely is going to come back to, um, to where it was. Um, if not to where it was in 2019, it will be close. We continue to see our job as, as, uh, as unchanged in this. Our job is to listen, to work with our partners, to work with our customers, to continue to make that printing environment what it should be, simple, secure, and infinitely flexible. None of those have changed. The hows, the whys, the how quicklies uh, inside of that is, uh, is where we are seeing um, much of that change. So uh, with that, um, I've been talking quickly and talking long. I'm going to take a, uh, I'm going to take a, a, a this point to turn this back over to Lindsay and then we'll jump into uh, questions and answers. There were some submitted ahead of time uh, as people were signing up and, and we'll look at those that were submitted. If you haven't submitted, feel free to, uh, to do so. Um, Lindsay? Okay, perfect, thank you, Kevin. Um, so yeah, we did have a couple of questions come in, so I'll share those. Um, but before I do that, I did want to mention that we will be sending a follow-up email to everyone with the recording of today's event. So you want to look out for that message. And we also have several additional events in the works. So um, those can be on topics like direct printing, true cloud, Chrome OS printing, touchless print, and more. So you'll want to stay tuned as we begin to add those to our event calendar. So. Great. Thanks, Lindsay. I will. I will answer the mm -hmm. first. Uh, the first question that came up um, from from uh, our our friends catching uh, catching me in a typo there. Um, IoT and uh, with the capital O versus the uh, capital I. Uh, yeah, IoT is inter is Internet of Things. Um, I've been typing iOS too too long, so thanks for catching that uh, that typo. Uh, I will touch on that though, because I think the internet of things, um, and the reason I bring that up is increasingly the this market, even before we started, has looked at printers and said, we believe printers are um, should be playing as a nice client in the internet of things. They should be cloud native. They should be able to uh, be ac accessed, um, installed, managed, accessed, um, as a true secure cloud client in and of themselves. So we'll talk about it as both cl cloud native printing um, as a um, concept, as the as the Internet of Things. But uh, thanks thanks for that. Um, the, uh, the the catch on the typo. So sorry, Lindsay. Go ahead. Yep. Um, so one of the questions we had come in was that we'd love to learn more about your plans for Chrome OS integrations. Excellent, great, uh, great question, and um, uh, that's another one that the, another item that uh, popped into our focus in 2020, um, as as Google announced the uh, the that they were going to be end of lifeing uh, uh, Google Print. Uh, Ferros has been working directly uh, with Google. Um, we have uh, and do embrace Chrome OS and and. Uh, uh, Chrome OS printing across our entire product suite, whether we're talking about our cloud products or our on-premise products. And just recently, alongside Google, Ferros was uh, uh, was identified and uh, recognized as an enterprise-ready Google partner in in doing that. So um, we view we view Chrome OS as uh, one of those kind of Uber mobility uh, applications or environments that um, um, that we also see growing as we look at at the uh, the impacts of COVID. All right, another one we had is when everyone's at home and the printers are at work, are folks supporting personal printers in any capacity? If, is there something else we can do with this print infrastructure or do we just turn it off? Yeah, 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 good, good, uh, then not, another good question. And, um, and yeah, that's, that is something that we've, um, we've, adjusted to as we've as we've looked at 2020 um 
we have large scale enterprises, hundreds of thousands of, uh, of people who are forced to move home and move home quickly um, and start working from home. Uh, so many organizations that had paper required processes found themselves buying um, uh, local or, or printers for at home use. Um, and as they did so, uh, very quickly moved into the, we, we want to send these devices home, but we also want to make sure that they're secure. We want to make sure that we can monitor them. Um, we want to make sure that our employees can easily print to these, uh, to these devices. Uh, and our, our products from a data analytics standpoint have long monitored local devices, whether they're at home or whether they're, uh, uh, or whether they're inside of a corporate network. Um, but now increasingly we've been looking at, um, uh, I was talking about the infrastructure to deliver direct printing. Um, just to explain a little bit more about what that means, um, many people who look at Pharos and uh, and those in our space think about us as this concept of pull printing or secure printing, securing all the printers, um, badging in, authenticating at a print device to then release my uh, my my print file. Um, that is a um, that is a, a a big portion of what we do. But as we start looking at infrastructure. Uh, not all printing is done that way. A large amount of printing is not um, badge released, home printing being one of them. So organizations looking at how do I use an infrastructure that enable, how do I use your um, cloud or zero infrastructure technologies and capabilities, simple abilities to print directly to the printer. Um, so that's another one that we have seen at home. Um, no print driver management. Right? We, we want to use the same print driver, same print process, monitored, managed, whether I'm printing at home or whether I'm printing directly at work or whether I'm printing through um, um, through a secure or, or pull print queue. So, um, so yeah, we, we are seeing that need for at home monitoring as well as infrastructure. Perfect, Kevin. I know you just, you were just talking to direct print um, and we had a question come in that said, we heard about direct print from Pharos. Can you talk about that a bit? Was there anything else you want to add on that topic before I ask another question? No, I, the only thing I would add on that, uh, Lindsay, is that uh, we we see the, uh, the the market and the design the where Pharos is is playing shifting over time from um, just print management, like what we're talking about here, as um, um, secure printing or pull printing or um, or data analytics to an IT infrastructure service. Um, it's a different problem that we're solving, but it's organizations that are embracing um, infrastructure moving into the cloud uh, and or zero trust infrastructures are realizing they have a printing problem. So those organizations that are looking to migrate infrastructure to infrastructure as a service um, need direct printing. File print, it comes out, I don't wanna wait, um, just like they need secure printing print, walk up to a device anywhere on the network and release it. So as we shift to an infrastructure services company, in addition to what we do for direct printing, that infrastructure needs to be able to handle those types of printing workflows uh, just as easily across that same secure infrastructure. So that's that's what we mean when we talk about direct print. Perfect, thank you. Um, so another question is, does Faro support contactless printing or app-based printing where users can authenticate via an app on the printer hardware and collect their print. And they're also asking if we support Canon printer hardware. So uh, I'll answer the second part. Yes, absolutely. We support Canon hardware. We've been a, a long time Canon partner, um, uh, support all the major uh, OEMs. We are a multi-vendor. Um, uh, and then I'll cycle back to the contactless. Uh, uh, we talked about touchless, zero touch. Um, what we have found is that the majority of our clients, um, the, the, the vast majority of the print experience where people walk up to our um, uh, printers and, print and controlled devices is I authenticate usually through a, a, a badge, but I'll authenticate, could be a mobile phone, could be a, a proximity badge. Um, and the vast majority of the time it's print all, swipe, print all. Um, there are times where people want to delete or change the finishing options of what it is that they've printed or print and save, but the majority of the time it's print all. So what we were able to do very quickly is to say, um, if the majority of the time it's print all, then why don't we change all of our 
optionally for those organizations that want to move to this uh, this form. As soon as I badge in, the immediate new experience in, in Zero Touch or, or contactless is the screen comes up and says, unless you stop me, I'm going to print all. Um, and we'll give people about five seconds to uh, to interrupt the process. If they need to go in and change options and operate off the panel, then they need to do that. Um, but the majority of the time they don't. So that was something that we've uh, we implemented and we were able to implement on our cloud por uh, portfolio in a matter of uh, in a matter of weeks and have it in production. Um, but it does work across all of our product line. Okay, another one. Um, we have a couple minutes left here. Um, can you share more about measuring and managing virtual worker print? Uh, yeah, so um, so I guess if we if we're talking about uh, virtual workers, then I'm guessing what we're talking about is is predominantly uh, remote uh, remote workers, or uh, we may be talking about virtual desktop. We we do work with virtual desktop in a VDI environment. Um, if we're talking about remote working, we talked about that uh, a, a while back. Um, from our standpoint, uh, one of the foundations of the founding of Pharos is the premise that that it's not printers that print, it's people that print. So we fundamentally view our business, our technology, our monitoring and our integration, our, our interactions at the user level. So whether we're talking about uh, virtual environments, remote workers, local workers, home workers, um, our focus is first, first and foremost on the user um, in addition to uh, what we do on the printing. Okay, um, we have two more that came in, so I think we, we have time to cover those before we let everybody go. Um, so one is, can you print from Google Chromebooks? Yes. Yep. And then uh, another one that came in is, we've been watching the manufacturer market consolidate over the past few years with some acceleration moving into the pandemic. As we move out of the pandemic, what are your thoughts on industry consolidation given the increased revenue pressure and lower volumes? Which vendors will be well positioned to move forward and which vendors will be more susceptible to failure or acquisition? Yeah, good, uh, very, very good question. You're probably not gonna like my answer. Um, I do believe there will be continued consolidation. I think that just makes sense when we look at the industry. One of the things I was going to say right at the beginning is, um, but before before buying into any of my predictions, if you if you uh, if you were to monitor my stock performance, um, I'm average at best. So, trying to predict which of those vendors is going to is going to pursue and 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 win at the end of the day, um, that's that's a that's a tougher one. And uh, and since we partner with all of them, I really don't want to necessarily go and, and speculate in that in that space. Um, what I what I will say is, uh, I think you've got a couple of forces that are going on inside of this. Um, you do have declining markets, whether whether you look at the pandemic or not, we've got declining markets um, and you've got uh, a proliferation of vendors. So that tends to lean towards there's going to be consolidation um, in the industry. Um, the second piece is uh, I think every single one of them is getting hurt on their balance sheet as we make our way through COVID. Um, so that's going to create a challenge for, um, for consolidation. Uh, on the one hand, um, there may be some perceived bargains out there. If printing is going to go back to 85 to 90 percent, the market might overcorrect and and uh, and there may be some bargain purchases for organizations to decide, to decide they're going to combine. Um, but the flip side is I think balance sheets are going to be are going to be struggling coming out of this. But um, if I had to predict, I would say yes, we'll see some con some continued consolidation over the years. How fast and who is a different discussion. Perfect. Thank you, Kevin. Um, so we have one minute left. Um, so I'm just gonna close up here. We do have a couple remaining questions, so we will make sure to, um, in our follow-up message, um, answer those. Um, so just a special thank you to everyone who joined us today and to you, Kevin, for all of the insight related to the pandemic and the world of print. Um, like I mentioned earlier, we will be following up with everyone with a link to the recording of today's webinar. And if you have questions or comments about what you heard today, please don't hesitate to reply to the follow-up email or reach out to anyone at Pharos and we will help get you the answers you need.
So we hope you all enjoy the rest of your day and please stay healthy and safe. Thank you. Thanks, Lindsay. Thank you, everybody.